budget committee meeting for the 2018-2019 Board of Education budget. Today, the administration will give us details about the nutrition services budget, our federal programs budgets, and an update on the operating budget. Board members will have the opportunity to pose questions, and if the administration is unable to answer questions at this time, they will develop a response and send it to all board members. As a reminder to the viewing audience, we will have a public hearing on the budget today, immediately following this budget committee meeting, and we will hold another public hearing on the budget tomorrow at 6 p.m. following the Board of Education meeting. I would like to publicly thank Dr. Joseph and his team for the tremendous amount of work that they've been doing this budget season as we've worked to align our budget to our strategic plan. Last year, we came together as a Board of Education in collaboration with Dr. Joseph's team in order to develop a strategic plan that is already showing promising results to our community. I can't tell you how encouraged I was personally to see how much growth in reading and math is happening in schools within the Antioch and the Cane Ridge clusters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has been as a result of the intentional focus that has been placed on improving teaching and learning within our school district. I've also been extremely pleased with what I'm seeing at our middle schools who are participating in the STEAM transformation that is happening within our school district. I want our entire MNPS team to know that your hard work is not going unnoticed. And it has been a pleasure, both as a school board member and as the chair of the budget committee, to see our ability to target resources to support first instruction, professional development, and increased compensation for all employees. This is contributing to us finally seeing positive and accelerated growth in reading performance, mathematics, performance and student engagement of all students. I am so pleased I decided to work to remain on this Board of Education to continue to fight for equity and excellence for all students, especially students in the Cane Ridge and the Antioch clusters of schools. We are doing great work and that work needs to continue at an accelerated rate. It is my hope that we continue to accelerate our academic growth by passing a budget that continues to move us in a positive direction. At this time, I will turn the microphone over to Chris Henson, our Chief Operating Officer, who will set the stage and begin today's presentation. And Mr. Henson, please let us know if you would like for us to ask any questions after each presentation or whether you prefer for us to hold our questions to the end of the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hunter, and it's up to the board. The, I'm at the board's pleasure, so if you would rather wait or if you'd rather go ahead and ask your questions uh, as I'm presenting, either way is fine with me. Thank you. Uh, as was indicated, as you can see on your agenda, uh, we've got uh, several things to discuss uh, in this afternoon's committee meeting. Uh, the first thing would be our Nutrition Services Fund, and you should have that in front of you on top. Uh, just as a reminder for those of you who uh, have forgotten or, or may not know, the Nutrition Services Fund is a self-supporting enterprise fund. It, uh, it uh, supports itself uh, with its own funding, and um, it's a separate fund from both the General Purpose Operating Fund as well as from the Federal Programs and Grants Fund. If you turn to the first page, uh, the first page is a snapshot of revenues and expenses. The estimated cash reserves or fund balance at the beginning of next fiscal year, July 1, 2018, estimated at approximately $15.1 million. The, obviously the largest uh, source of funding for this uh, particular program would be federal USDA meal reimbursements. Uh, we're estimating almost $35 million in federal USDA meal reimbursements as well as a, a new line this year that we haven't had for the last several years for paid meals. As was indicated at the last board meeting, uh, the community, there are changes uh, with the community eligibility program, and so we will go, be going to what's called a hybrid uh, community eligibility program where some schools, approximately half, will qualify to continue offering uh, no-cost lunch to all students. The other half of the schools would go back to the previous method uh, where we would still offer free meals, free and reduced meals uh, to students and families that qualify. The others would uh, would pay as they have in the past. Mr. Henton, for um, the community's uh, purpose, can you just uh, reiterate how that process happened? I think people, I think there's still some confusion uh, regarding uh, whether this was a budgetary uh, situation on the school district's part or, um, you know, is it a result of 
you know, a grant expiring or something. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's something. It's a program that's a four-year program, uh, where the school district is required to apply uh, every four years, and we simply do not qualify anymore as a district-wide community eligibility program. Uh, it's not a part of any budget cutting measure or anything of that nature. It's simply that the school district no longer qualifies for the entire district to be under the community eligibility program because of the drop in our student poverty percentage. Uh, it's heavily driven by the student poverty percentage through the direct certification process. And as you remember from the presentation at the last board meeting, it takes about a 60% poverty rate for this program to be able to continue district-wide. Uh, we're sitting between 47 and 48%. We won't know the exact number for a couple of more weeks, uh, but it's obvious that we would no longer be able to qualify for the program. So thank you for, for asking that. We also have on the revenue side a la carte sales uh, to our students. Total budgeted revenue in the Nutrition Services Fund of 40, approximately $46.5 million. Under expenses, of course, the largest uh, source of expenses would be labor, salaries, and benefits. Uh, those are projected to be around $25 million. We also have, a, of course, a large expenditure for food purchases of over $14 million. The Nutrition Services Fund does pay for its share of utilities in the kitchen, and you can see under the ex expenses, the utilities uh, we're estimating between 1.2 and 1.3 million dollars uh, for the Nutrition Services Fund to reimburse the General Purpose Operating Fund uh, for the cost of utilities in the kitchens. Total budget expenditure, total budgeted expenses of 48.6 million dollars. With an est leaving an estimated cash reserve at the end of next fiscal year, June 30th, 2019, of just under $13 million. You can see at the bottom of the page, uh, there are some items that, were, uh, that are being planned to be funded from the reserve, uh, specifically uh, hood replacements in the kitchens, digital menu boards, and point of sale system upgrade, uh, $2.125 million to be spent from the reserve, uh, and those would be uh, non-recurring one-time expenditures coming out of the reserve for this particular fund. Any questions on this page? Again, it's a snapshot of, of revenue and expenses for this fund. Thanks, Chris. I do, can we go back to the CLP? I have a, a, CEP. CEP, sorry. I had a couple of questions about that. Um, I may have to seek some reinforcement okay, sure. behind me up here if it gets too complicated. So, um, just trying to figure out that multiplier of 1.6, correct? So if we are sitting at 47, 48%, is, is that then you add the 1.6? You multiply that times 1.6? Okay. So you're saying we need to be at 60, correct? That's what we So that what said puts it up to like a 95%? 95%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have we determined that 95% qualification? eligibility or is it's, that set somewhere else? It's just the way that the, the numbers work out to be able to fund the program, uh, no cost lunch. The calculation is a 95% uh, would be needed to re receive the, the adequate USDA reimbursement that would be needed to continue the program. Okay, and is that in line with other districts? Do you know 95% is general? And yeah, Ken, it, I would just introduce yourself too sure. for the public. Uh, Ken Stark, uh, Executive Officer Operations. Uh, yes, that 95% is a very typical ratio, and actually it's a little lower. People actually aim higher. So, again, keep in mind that reimbursement is the percentage of the federal reimbursement. So the federal reimbursement on a free lunch is $3.31. So that means we're get, at 95%, we're getting 5%. Um, less on that for every meal. So as you lower the percentage, your reimbursement um, decreases. So, okay, so are you actually eligible? It's just, it's just not, you're not going to make up that gap? The, um, the, uh, I, I think technically we could be eligible, but you have to also at the same time be able to, to adequately fund it and be at a uh, zero loss status. Okay. And then the other question is, um, do we, it sounds like we believe the students are there. It sounds like we believe that we have students, our direct cert numbers should be higher, but they're not, they're not self-reporting. Is this correct? 
Um, I think we do believe the number is higher. The question is we're not entirely sure how high it should be because of some of the data issues that we have and the inability to um, match to the state database. Um, there is also the issue with, um, as you mentioned, the uh, under, uh, under applying. So if a family, for whatever reason, chooses not to apply for SNAP or TANF, um, then they would not count as directly certified, even though by an income standard they may apply, okay. or they may qualify, sorry. So I'm sure your your office is stretched. I know we've got the work of Tony Majors. Are there people who, who go out and try to find the families to make sure that they are filling out the forms? Uh, um, you mean internally or right. outside or groups? Right, or either one. Is that a, is that a possibility? It's, it's a possibility. I met with a group this week to talk some about that. Um, it's certainly something that, that we can look towards. The difficulty is that we have to, for next school year, we have to use April 1st data. So it would, essentially it was all of the kids that had applied and were in the SNAP and TANF database before it before March started, really. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So to ask. Sure. Thank you, um, Chris. The, if I understood you correctly, uh, about half of the schools will continue with CEP, and the other half will not. That's the estimate at this point. Until we have the final numbers, which we think we'll have in the third week of April, then we'll know what the exact April one data looks like but we're estimating right now approximately half will still qualify for uh, totally no-cost lunch, and then the other half would go back to the previous method. So in the schools that have to go back to the previous method, does every family have to reapply? Well, the families that want to apply for free and reduced status, they would, would have to, uh, they would have have to, to go reapply. through that process. Yes. But in the schools where you think they will uh, continue to CEP, does the family have to reapply there? No, that, that there we'll there's, just, there's okay. no application process once a, a school is determined to be uh, CEP eligible. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this page? Uh, the, the next page is the same format as document number three in the operating budget, and it's just intended to reflect the total number of work days, total number of paid days for our nutrition services staff. Obviously, uh, very heavily driven by the number of student days. Each of our uh, nutrition services staff members also receive 16 paid time off days for vacation and holidays, as well as uh, paid for working when students aren't there for orientation, training, and administrative duties. And you can see what the total number of paid days are for each of those types of nutrition services staff. It's unchanged from the current year. The next page just shows the expenditure budget. Uh, it's in the same format as our general purpose operating budget. Uh, it, it shows uh, salaries and benefits, food, supplies and materials, other expenses, equipment, travel mileage, etc. You can see the, the same total of just uh, 48.6 million at the bottom. Uh, it's, it's just uh, presented in a little different format, but a format that you're already familiar with from the general purpose operating budget. And then we've included the meal prices down at the bottom. And you can see, uh, as we indicated at the, the last board meeting, breakfast will continue at no cost to all students. And we have the lunch prices here, elementary and middle schools at $2.50, uh, high schools at $2.75. The next page, if there aren't any questions on that one, the next page, uh, just share some data regarding year-to-date meal, meal count comparisons over the last several years. Uh, so it goes back to 15-16, uh, then last year 16-17, and then year-to-date for 17-18. We have the uh, school breakfast and school lunch programs during the regular school term. We have the summer feeding program, and then we have the afternoon snacks and after-school supper program. And then the last page is a similar graph to what you saw at the last board meeting when we discussed the community eligibility program showing the direct certification history. 
uh, where in 2014 it was at a little over 61 percent and how it's fallen to uh, approximately 40 between 47 and 48 uh, percent for this year again we won't know what those official numbers will be for a couple of more weeks it also shows at the top the number of identified students uh, compared to enrollment to get to that identified student percentage. Any questions on the Nutrition Services Fund? Again, it's a self-supporting enterprise fund uh, that is separate from both the operating budget and the federal programs and grants fund. come back to it if you would like. The next document you have in the next item, number three on the agenda, the Federal Programs and Grants Fund. Um, this is typically what we have shared with you uh, during budget process. Uh, if you remember, the federal fiscal year is a different fiscal year than ours. It runs from October 1st to September 30th. And so we're dealing with some very preliminary numbers. And so what we try to do is through this process, uh, if you turn the page, what we try to do is to share with you what our best estimate at this point is for all the different types of federal programs and grants and what you're doing, you would be funding, you would be approving basically uh, an amount that we believe we're going to receive and spend for next year. It's obviously projected. Uh, and by far the largest federal program would be Title I. Uh, we're estimating flat funding at this point. Uh, of approximately $29.4 million. And we can talk more about Title I funding if you'd like. We have the, the federal programs folks here behind me. Uh, the next would be IDEA, or Individuals with Disabilities Education Act funding for our exceptional education students at just under $19 million. The next would be our pre-K expansion, which would be our federal uh, preschool expansion grant through the state. Uh, you can see that we're planning to, again, uh, receive and spend approximately eight million dollars for that grant for next year. The next one, the school improvement grant or SIG grant, you can see is there's a big decrease. Uh, schools qualify for school improvement grants for a certain number of years and then those funds uh, sunset and so we're, we're showing and reflecting a, a significant decrease in the amount of school improvement grant funding uh, that we will receive. Dr. Gentry. I have a question. So with the school improvement dollars, what have we what have we in the past used those funds for? I'm going to turn to um, my colleagues from the federal programs office because each school determines uh, through their school improvement plan how they're going to divvy up their grant funding. But I will let I will let uh, I mean, just high level. Phyllis I mean, or is Mary. It academic programs? Is it positions? Or Dr. Phil? Personnel. Personnel primarily. Okay. So. Please come to the microphone. Hello. Um, so I'm to identify Dyer, yourself for the public. The executive director of federal programs, and I have with me Dr. Mary Clark, who is the director of grants management in federal programs. And um, so our school improvement funds, the current schools that are um, participating with that grant are Inglewood Elementary, Jerry Baxter, John Woodset Elementary, Kip at Kirkpatrick, and Madison. Uh, middle school, uh, which are priority schools. So um, what we have done with that, those funds in the past is those particular, um, that particular grant uh, goes toward the uh, school different various school improvement models in our priority schools. Um, this is the last year of this particular grant, and so that's why you see, as uh, Chris was saying, the grant as we know it now is sunsetting, um, but we are in um, conferences and consultation with the state right now because those funds are going to look different, but they're still going to go for school improvement for our lowest performing schools. And we're working with the state to see how that's going to look and what those funds will be. So the 500,000 is an estimate or? But that 500,000 is what we anticipate having remaining okay. with the current grant that we have, this current cohort. 
and um, we will be looking to use that to close out the grant and anticipate our upcoming school improvement funds. It ends September. It, it, yeah, the, the grant sunsets uh, September 30th. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you stay? Yes, sorry. I will. <laughs> so um, I, d I don't have the sheet with me. I had kind of done my own tracker of, uh, of our different schools and where they had been falling with the state rankings, knowing that we've got a, a more schools on the cusp list. Um, how have you felt like the impact from these, from these school improvement grant dollars have done in terms of results? Like, will we see those schools exiting? or getting close. I know Inglewood and Whitsitt seems like they've made the most progress, but if my memory serves right, Whitsitt was just barely over the bottom 10 line. So Graymar exited off of the last school improvement list, off of the last priority list. Okay. Um, and as you said, we do anticipate Whitsitt and Inglewood exiting um, from the, the current list that we have. Um, so we have seen improvement, and um, I, could probably, I could probably better answer yeah. that okay. question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, just in terms of when we're looking at these dollars, we know we want to always make sure that we're getting yeah. that they're being used in a way that produces so, results. So to, there's twofold to that question. So when Dr. Joseph came on board, we met with the Commissioner of Education to appropriate dollars in a different way, as compared to how it was appropriate before. So um, um, do we? The each all of the schools are making progress, so it's not as easy to say they're going to automatically exit because the state takes the bottom five percent. Right. So what you're seeing in the last two years that we are doing differently has been more around teacher capacity training for them around different pieces around literacy and reading and those components, and also teacher retention, so trying to provide more uh, bonuses to them in terms of keeping teachers at the particular school. And the other components in also giving uh, principals more time to work with, um, get more direct services into school as compared to the two years before. So to answer your question, we anticipate probably two or three schools may be able to exit. We can't say all of them because it's a moving target. Right. Sometimes it's based on how many schools are closed in the state and the bottom 5%. On that cusp list that you saw, it was actually the bottom 10% schools on there. So that's why the list looks so wide. So there's, um, there's us, there's Shelby County, there's Hamilton, and so there's all these other places. And so we would anticipate, um, to answer your first question, yes, we anticipate schools to increase, to tell you they're all automatically going to move out. It's a hard target to tell you that, you know, five, six schools will move. It's not as easy as that. But we will. We would say that we've seen um, the state has designated two to three of our schools in terms of performing well based on their metrics, and so they have been able to kind of move forward. So um, Whitsitt Elementary is one of the schools, um, Inglewood Elementary School, and then Pearl Cone has had a lot of progress as well, but we can't tell you for that final list. Ms. Pierce, I would chair, I, I believe it was the two um, board updates ago. Uh, we put in your packet information regarding Buena Vista and Napier as examples of what the plans were. And we did share that we could give the board progress, the progress of all nine, uh, if you were interested. Uh, I believe, I can't remember if I put that in the packet, but I can, we, we keep, we are required to m monitor those schools' performance on, on a monthly basis, and we have been, uh, so we could easily uh, give you information so you can see specifically where those schools have uh, performed, particularly on our measures of academic progress in math and reading. Uh, we are pleased with uh, some of the growth that we're seeing, uh, knowing that much work needs to be done. Uh, but this is one of the reasons we have been uh, really talking about the equity and making sure that the schools with the uh, greatest need be, uh, get uh, more dollars in a, in a way we can do that because we clearly saw a correlation between uh, the levels of poverty within a school and the student achievement. And as we have been working within those schools, looking at the needs of those schools, uh, we've been trying to really target uh, based upon you know research-based practices, things that we know we can invest in to get a greater outcome. Uh, but we can, we can get you the performance on all nine of those schools, so you can, and that, that could probably answer your question. I can probably put a summary together for you. That would be helpful. Sure. Okay. Dr. Gentry? Uh, well, Dr. Joseph said what I was going to say about the, 
how the Title I reallocation is going to help to compensate for this grant that's phasing out. But I, I do want to just be kind of just say something in, in plain English that we've had these funds for five years, right? I see a yes and a no. Not this cohort. Not the cohort, the, the 18999. Did that grant, how, did that, the, the school improvement dollars, that grant started? This cohort four, this is, they're finishing their third year. They don't get to have it the fourth and fifth year as was promised initially, because the federal right. grant is gone. Okay. But as Phyllis said, the state has school improvement with your Title I dollars off the top, and they are working with us now. In fact, we have a webinar next week on how to apply for those grants. Yeah, but the, the grant itself, cohort aside, when did we start receiving the sort of the school improvement Dollars. The first school improvement grant um, came in the Obama administration in 2010, okay. and was we received it. There was a webinar in 2009 when they first rolled it out, and we had a SIG one, then we had a SIG two, and now a SIG four. And they've been at different schools and different goals and objectives. Well, and and I, I ask because the other thing I was going to mention is um, referencing the packet a couple of um, meetings ago. Um, this is the first time we've actually had transparency into how those dollars are being used. So I do thank you all um, for that, because um, I remember the meeting when the school improvement plans were presented <laughs> way back when, um, and they don't look anything uh, like those plans. And so I do appreciate uh, the effort and the intentionality um, uh, about how those dollars are being used. And hopefully we can continue that um, under the auspices of the Title I funds as well. And, and I think that lessons learned on the SIG grant, so that the state plans are, are, are trying to do more effective work. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the office that they created? Split government office? I mean, oh, okay. go ahead. Go All ahead. right. I'll let Chris. <laughs> Y'all may want to stay close. <laughs> <laughs> um, below the SIG grant or school improvement grant, you have the I-Zone, uh, which is basically flat funding, and uh, they, uh, the group uh, of my colleagues can answer any questions about I-Zone. We also have the pre-K state grant, which is uh, different than the pre-K expansion grant from the federal government. The pre-K state grant has been longstanding with the district. It funds a number of our uh, current and has funded a number of our current pre-K classrooms across the district. We also have Title II funding, Title IIA funding for teacher and principal training and recruiting, as well as Title III funding for English language acquisition, enhancement, and academic achievement. Carl Perkins CTE, or Career Technical Education Funding, uh, is flat. You can see most of these are projected to be flat, uh, these federal programs going from uh, th this year into next year. I'm not going to go through each of these unless you have specific questions. I did want to touch at least on those that were over a million dollars. Uh, I will we'll direct you down to the bottom part of the page where the asterisks are uh, indicating new grants. Uh, we have approximately $3.8 million in new grants, uh, particularly the Magnet School Assistance Program, or MSAP grant, uh, which funded uh, magnet programs at several of our schools. And then uh, we have the Education Innovation and Research, or EIR, pyramid model, projected to be at $2.5 million next year two music uh, grants, National Endowment for the Arts and Professional Development for Arts Educators grants, which total uh, approximately $450,000 each. And you can see the other. Uh, what we've done, we typically try to plan for a contingency of around $5 million for any new grants uh, that we might receive. And that's what we were able to, that's how we were able to fit these new grants into uh, the current year budget because we had a $5 million contingency. We have approximately $3.8 million in new grants. And so the current year contingency is at around $1.2 million. So we're estimating next year, based upon these new grants, that our federal programs and grants fund will increase from approximately $78.2 million to approximately $85 million. And again, any questions on any of these federal programs or any of these grants, the, the federal programs and grants uh, folks can answer. Right. Nope. Okay, no questions. We'll go then to the general purpose operating budget. Uh, you have a draft in front of you dated uh, today's date, April 9th. There are minimal changes uh, to this. 
Um, we continue, you know, it's always a work in progress uh, as we submit it, and then as time moves on, we receive additional information. Um, you can, if you turn to the first page, which is document number one, you can see it, it's very similar to what was presented to you on March the 27th. It's the same bottom line uh, number, an increase of approximately $44.7 million with a request for the general purpose fund of approximately $924 million, a 5.1% increase. Uh, there are a couple of changes uh, that came about, and, and some of them, uh, frankly, are appreciated because they came about from board member questions. And so we realized there were a few things that we needed to tweak and, uh, and to revise. One of the things that, uh, that I didn't mention uh, the last time that I presented the, mark, the first draft on March 27th was Dr. Joseph had challenged the, the budget team to reduce travel. And so what we ended up doing was we went back and looked at the actual travel expenditures for 2016-17, which is, of course, our, our latest fiscal year where we have actual numbers. We took that number for each line item and then reduced it by 10%. Uh, we did not do that uh, for the board's travel because we hadn't talked about it, uh, but if you'd like, we can do that. Uh, but you can see down at the bottom of the page where it says uh, various reduction to travel. This reflects a reduction to travel of over $841,000 uh, through the budget. And this was something that was proposed late in the game for our first draft, and so we weren't able to fit those travel dollars to the appropriate line items between uh, when the request was made and when we needed to present this to you on March 27th. And so we had a little time between then and now where we were able to go back and now have uh, the travel lines populated with that 2016-17 actual less 10% number. The other change that uh, is reflected here is uh, when we presented the budget to you last year, uh, there was a 3% raise for all employees included in that budget for last year. And then later on in the process, the decision was made that the director of schools, the chiefs, and the executive officers would not receive an increase. And so, and, and we and they have not, uh, but we didn't go back and adjust the budget. I think it was something that was decided later, maybe after it was presented to the mayor, I can't remember. So we didn't go back and, and uh, change the budget uh, to reflect what's actually being paid. And so we've revised those few, there's not many, uh, those few salary lines to reflect in the 1819 proposal, the actual salary plus a 2% increase, which is the, what is being proposed. And so those are the two main changes uh, from what was presented to you back on uh, March the 27th. I will say that, uh, as I said earlier, it is a work in progress, particularly uh, document number eight, which is the line 31 page uh, detailed line item budget, where we have uh, column I, which is uh, reflecting remarks. Uh, these are, uh, to say it uh, kindly, these are difficult to keep up with uh, because uh, they are very detailed, and so we've asked our folks, our staff, to review uh, all of their budget accounts and line items and make sure that the remarks uh, are reflecting what's actually being requested for 1819. Uh, we've made some of those changes here in this particular version. Uh, we'll continue to make those changes as they come to us, but again, uh, we appreciate the board's questions about some of these line items because it did bring to our attention. Some of them did need to be updated, and so we appreciate that. Uh, but we'll continue to uh, improve uh, that column and to try to make those remarks succinct, but also uh, allow some explanation for different line items. Uh, there's no way to, of course, put uh, everything here in, in this particular document, but if you have any questions about any account, uh, feel free to ask, and we'll provide you with a, a much more detailed uh, response than you can see on, on the remarks column here on document number eight. Again, this is reflecting basically the same um, as we had before, same bottom line, same increase. Um, there's nothing really new uh, in this draft compared to the March 27th draft. And I'm happy to walk you through once again each of these documents if you would like or just wait to see if you have specific questions. Jill. Thank you, Chris. Um, on the present salary scale, it takes 13 years for a teacher to make $50,000. Uh, and that's with the bachelor's degree. With a master's degree, it takes 10 years to get a $50,000 salary. 
A 2% raise for $50,000 is only, only $1,000. And for chiefs who make $185,000, that yields $3,700. Um, a 2% pay raise for the director uh, with a $285,000 salary, 13% deferred compensation, and the ability to sell back 10 vacation days, and this budget is reflected at $7,300. Now, teachers are the backbone of this district. We know that, and I love seeing you nod your head. Thank you, Chris. It's difficult for teachers, workers, bus drivers to live in Nashville, Tennessee, and many work two jobs. So I suggest that the money uh, goes, this 2% raise, goes to the people who need it most, which would be teachers and workers. Uh, a reorganization uh, of Title I, uh, I'm sorry, a reorganization of central office uh, occurred just under a year ago, and for many, this included pay raise. Across the country, we know that teachers, uh, we hear about, we read, we see on the news um, and the uh, evening news that, that teachers are walking out in Chicago, Oklahoma, and West Virginia. But Metro teachers have been loyal. In this day and age, when we say we focus on equity, I think it's incumbent on us to ensure that this small 2% pay raise go to the folks who need it the most. So I suggest uh, a pay raise be distributed to employees who make under $150,000. Um, I was elected by my constituents to ask questions, to hold the director accountable, but sometimes I receive conflicting information. On March the 7th, in response to my question, HR responded, according to payroll records this year, Maritza Gonzalez has not received any stipend or extra compensation. Consequently, I was provided a document that provided and improved evidence that Gonzalez indeed received a stipend of $24,168.29. In addition to her salary of $130,831.71, um, um, upon further investigation on April 4th, I received a very different story, and I quote, five employees, Maritza Gonzalez, Amy White, Antoinette Williams, Terry Schrader, and Vanessa Garcia, all went from being an executive officer to executive directors as part of the central office reorganization. Their salaries went from 155,000 to 130,000. The decision was made to keep their salaries, all of their salaries intact through the end of the fiscal year. This necessitated treating the difference in pay as a stipend rather than salary. That difference in pay, about $961 per pay period, goes away at the end of the fiscal year when the new budget takes place. Now, the reorganization occurred at the beginning of our current fiscal year, hence the stipend is for one full fiscal year. When I checked with Ms. Garcia and Ms. Williams and Mr. Schrader, each confirmed they had not received any additional compensation, which means the only person who received the $24,000 stipend was the wife of the Chief of Schools, Maritza Gonzalez. As one of nine board members, I have an obligation to ask for accurate information. We have one and only one employee, and that is, the response, that is our responsibility to hold him accountable, to evaluate him twice a year. Unfortunately, I can't determine truth when responses to my inquiries breathe pervasively conflicting and distorted information. This is another example of conflicting information from central office. Ms. Frog, I would like to ask you, as a result of this and the allegations raised this week on Channel 5, I request an emergency policy governance meeting next week. I take very seriously the allegations of misspending, and I suggest an investigation in the following points. Number one, consider ceasing piggyback contracts immediately. I request full transparency on all current contracts that resulted from piggyback contracts. Number two, it is imperative that the RFP process is followed without exception. Number three, 
revisit policy 2.800, expenditure of funds, where it says, and I quote, no expenditure shall be made except on an approved purchase order or contract. Number four, in policy 2805, 2.805, and I quote, purchases made by anyone not authorized by the appropriate officials shall become the personal responsibility of the person making the purchase agreement. The board will not, under any circumstances, be responsible for payments of any material, supplies, or services purchased by unauthorized individuals or in any unprescribed manner. Number five. Revisit policy 2.805, and I quote, the school system will purchase competitively and seek maximum educational value for every dollar expended. Authorization to purchase shall be provided by the board. Six, 2.808, and I quote, all purchases made by the school system shall be by purchase order or formal contract, and no purchases shall be made nor payment approved unless covered by an approved purchase order. Number seven, vendor relations, 2.809. Each order will be placed on the basis of quality, price, and delivery. Past services will be a factor if all other considerations are equal. No person officially connected with or employed by the school system will be an agent for or have any financial compensation or reward of any kind from any vendor for the sale of supplies, materials, equipment, or service. Number nine. Revisit 2.806, the lowest and or best bid shall be accepted provided the purchaser reserves the right to reject any and all bids or any part of any bid. 10, revisit comparability of services 2.300, and I quote, a system-wide salary schedule is adopted annually. I recommend any salaries not in alignment with the salary schedule be rectified immediately. 11, additional support from TSBA may be requested at this meeting, or may be required at this meeting. Uh, I ask the uh, chair, and she's not here today, to convene an ethics committee according to the policy 1.106 to discuss vi possible violations of our policies. In addition to these recommend uh, recommendations, I ask Ms. Mr. Pinkston and Dr. Gentry to move expediently to allow the board to complete the formative evaluation of Dr. Joseph, which is now three months late, according to our own policies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. I think, um, just for clarification, if we could have Ms. Story uh, come up and just uh, at least address the concern that came regarding the uh, stipend, I think that was that's one that you can address. And then as for the others, uh, we'll just uh, continue. I'll be happy to, and I'll take full responsibility for that era. What exactly happened was that um, the individuals that you named had an option to have their salaries decreased immediately, meaning going from 155 to 130, or they had an option to um, have their, tr their salary scaled back incrementally, so at the end of the fiscal year, they would be at the 130. Each one of them chose to go immediately to the 130 without any adjustment, and I take responsibility. I thought it was, I thought they had gone the other route. Um, Maritza Gonzalez, her responsibilities didn't change as we had anticipated. She still continued to uh, supervise the same area that she had before the reorg. That's because the executive officer for communications and engagement position was vacant. And the goal was to remove those responsibilities from her once the position was filled. So we kept her salary, her total salary at 155, and we did that by taking her base salary to the 130 and giving her a stipend for the additional amount to 155. As of today, that position still has not been filled, and she's continuing to maintain the same level of responsibilities <clears throat> that she had July 1 of this past year. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gentry. Oh. 
I'm so, oh, sure. I'd like to call for a point of order um, that we return to the review of the budget um, line item review. Thank you. Um, and so that we can be prepared for our community meeting at five o'clock. And so that anything that's regarding policy governance be uh, assigned to the appropriate meeting at the appropriate time. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we, we address some of the other uh, questions that came in, in the director's report uh, tomorrow. I'll happily uh, address some of those issues that were raised. Thank you. Ms. Peters. Yeah, so I don't know if Dr. Majors is here. Um, Tony Majors? Alvin Jones is here or Dr. Narcisse? So, in regards to the operating budget and the, and the changes made with the structure that we heard Dr. Majors' presentation, um, I just have a couple of questions about the, the reallocations of the repurposing of the staff, and particularly with the social workers, because I am hearing a lot of concern about that change in the budget. And so what I, what I want to try to understand is what is filling that void, or how are those, those services going to still be provided to students? Is it through a different, you know, another communities and schools or partner? Uh, help us understand so we can better respond to constituents and people who are emailing. I just got another one saying they were worried about the uh, loss of a social worker at Maplewood. So just to try to understand how we can let them know that through the budget we're, we can ha answer one that One of the better. things that we started last year, and that was expanding the counseling services that our guidance counselors did. We found that many of our guidance counselors were going into the schools and they were doing a lot of paperwork. And so what we, I think it was last year, if I'm not mistaken, we asked them to begin to spend a, a, a larger proportion of their time dealing with counseling directly to students. We also have gone back, so we, as we began to shift that, we went back and said, okay, we're trying to um, deal directly with uh, truancy as being a big issue. And so we want our counselors and our social workers to spend more time also with truancy. Uh, yes, we have gone back and we have made some changes, and but we had planned to take up that responsibility in counseling through our guidance counselors. Okay. So if I hear, if I hear your question correctly, you want to know about the seven social workers. So they repurposed some of those to um, the SEL4 quadrant based positions as you know the social emotional learning mm -hmm. has been a piece that um, um, we've been putting a lot into the budget so the and the way that they've been repurposing there are particular schools that have low rates of incidence around needing of a social work so they've re we've been repurposing those particular positions into those SEL quadrant areas so that is where some of the positions went into there's also um, I don't have the exact but, uh, Okay. So I guess what would be helpful too is okay. if we would know the, the maybe the schools or the, the quadrants and where they're having the most change and how how this new plan will not only not be you know, will be supported but make it better. I mean how, how does the new plan support students in a way that justifies the changes? So you would like to see basically where the changes are going to be made and us to come back and tell you more specifically how we're <laughs> going to compensate for those changes? Right, because, I mean, we're just trying to answer the questions to the con concerned parents, and I don't I don't know how to answer them. We, we can do that. We'll show you where we're actually providing more direct services to students based on this shift. We can okay. actually do that. Okay, and the, another, just one other question is the, like the truancy that you mentioned, uh, we understand that's going back to school level and just making sure that the schools are then staffed to handle that as well, because I have some schools that are losing a general assistant unless it's approved by an exception hire. So there's just a lot of, it's, it's, not, it's very in the weeds, I get it, but it's very real to them yes. and to those individual schools. Yes. And so if these bigger changes are being made, we need to know that the supports are absolutely in place on the ground uh, to to meet those needs and to support what we say we're going to do. So I think that's the the part that I'm still seeing the disconnect of of making sure that the people on the ground are are confident in what's coming their way. 
Yes, yes, we can show you that. Okay. We'll get those changes to you. I have some comments that I wanted to make tonight, and I apologize in advance for the length, but I think it's important that these comments, that I make them. A budget is a moral document. As an elected official representing all of Nashville's children, it matters to me that our budget reflects our morals. We must be good stewards of the school's resources, and we have an obligation to ensure that the funds entrusted to us are properly spent. Our budget discussions are not personal. They are about the policies that we enact as a board which will affect our community for the next decade or more, and it's our job to ask the hard questions. This year's budget has kept me up at night. Never before have I received so many concerns and questions about the budget, and not just about changes to Title I funding. A wide variety of concerns about this budget and the district spending have been raised. In poring over budget materials these last several weeks, I have found more questions than answers and have noted what, have, what appear to be a number of financial red flags. These are the issues that have come to my attention. Number one, over the past two years, there has been a dramatic increase in unauthorized purchase requests in the district. An unauthorized purchase request, or UPR, is just what it appears to be, an unauthorized expenditure. Ideally, a UPR is never used because a purchase order should always precede any purchase, and the only time a UPR should be used is in, in the case of an emergency, such as broken pipes. During this administration's first year, the number of unauthorized purchases increased more than sevenfold, from approximately $300,000 to $2.3 million. The trend continues this year. I'm aware that sometimes UPRs are triggered by accidental errors, and in a district as large as ours, there's certainly a human error percentage to take into account. But the ballooning number of unauthorized expenditures is a serious problem that warrants investigation. Number two, the administration entered into a no-bid contract or some sort of agreement with Research for Better Teaching and has paid this company over $100,000 without the required board approval, which is in violation of our board policies. I've heard more than one explanation from the administration about the lack of board approval, but the fact of the matter is that this contract was placed on the consent agenda for approval and then pulled immediately when a board member began asking questions. Paying vendors before seeking board approval has been an ongoing problem for this administration. Number three. There is an appearance of nepotism <coughs> happening within our district in a way that benefits a few, but that does not benefit our children. New employees with close ties to the new administration are being paid more money for less work, including unexplained stipends and salaries outside the salary schedule. For example, one chief spouse is making 24, a $24,000 stipend in addition to her salary, even though she has less job duties and less employees to supervise than others. And I'll, I'll also add that um, some of the duties that were just mentioned uh, um, are duties that were taken over uh, by Jana Carlaw for a period of time, so I'm not sure that we're getting accurate information there. Another chief's friend is making more than any other elementary school principal, including those with more credentials. MMPS is also paying half the cost for this principal to receive her doctorate. Furthermore, the first draft of this year's budget proposal reflected much higher pay increases for those at the top of the pay scale than the 2% raise offered to teachers. This was changed when a board member noticed the problem and pushed back. Number four, in the first year of this administration, consultant costs grew from 5.1 million to 8.6 million, and some of the new consultants appear to be problematic. For example, last August, the board approved a literacy contract with Read America LLC for $150,000. When I searched for information about this company, I was unable to find a website or other information online. The company appears to be a one-woman operation run out of someone's home in Chicago, and MNPS appears to be the sole source of this person's income. I also received complaints about another consultant, Bruce Taylor, and decided to look into his background. From Mr. Taylor's marketing website, I learned that he has no background or training in education, but is instead an actor who now pr promotes Common Core. The district has paid Mr. Taylor over $100,000 without board approval, and according to a News Channel 5 story, Mr. Taylor worked in the district six months without a contract. 
I am also concerned because I recently learned that an outside organization has brought in the former superintendent of Knox County Schools to work with MNPS. He's now attending executive leadership meetings. According to Knoxville board members, this man, quote, left a trail of disaster in his wake. Knoxville colleagues tell me their former superintendent spent too much and started too many unsustainable programs, leaving the school in financial straits. Now that the superintendent is gone, Knox County Schools must cut key programs to make up for the deficit. Number five, the administration is piggybacking substantial service contracts, some worth over a million dollars from contracts in other counties. Piggybacking is a procurement tool that allows for no-bid contracts. Piggybacking service contracts, as MNPS has done, is problematic because of the inherent risk of fraud and the potential to get less than the best price. One such no-bid service contract with Performance Matters was piggybacked from contracts in Shelby County, Tennessee and Orange County, Florida for a total of $1.1 million. Yet the Performance Matters contracts on file with the Metro Clerk's Office shows that the contracts are not to exceed $1.8 million. I want to know why the Board was not consulted on this change. Performance Matters is affiliated with a nonprofit company called Education Research and Development Institute, ERDI. According to a News Channel 5 story last week, Dr. Felder has received consulting fees from ERDI. ERDI partners include a number of other companies to which the district has awarded large contracts, including Discovery Education for $13 million and Scholastic, which hosted 10 Metro employees, including Dr. Felder, at the Ritz-Carlton on Amelia Island in February 2017. According to a News Channel 4 story, MNPS helped pay for the Amelia Island concert, co conference, sorry, but Scholastic also comped rooms for MNPS employees at the Five Star Hotel, where rooms typically cost $700 per night. Contract discussions with Scholastic took place on Amelia Island, and immediately after the conference, administrators tried to place an extremely large contract with Scholastic on the board agenda. It was pulled when a board member questioned it. A couple of months later, in April 2017, the board approved a two-month contract for Scholastic to supply classroom libraries for $140,000. I would like to know how much Scholastic paid for the Amelia Island Conference and for MNPS attendees specifically, including room fees, meals, drinks, and any other perks, as well as any consulting fees. We need an investigation into all consulting fees garnered by MNPS employees, particularly those related to companies affiliated with ERDI. I would also like to know which contracts with ERDI partner companies were no bid contracts. So in sum, these are the questions, I mean, these are the problems as I see them. Questionable contracts, consultants and expenditures, overpaid employees, and at the least, a disregard of proper procurement procedures. These problems have been amplified in light of the way the budget has been handled this season. With regard to contracts and consultants, the common theme seems to be avoidance of board scrutiny. That is the very opposite of transparency. Due to, quote, budget constraints this year, the district has already cut paper, toner, and other basic supplies from schools, curtailed professional development training starting in February, removed funding for school plays, cut out year-end celebrations, and in general defunded the efforts of those on the ground, the very people who touch lo children's lives daily. And now this administration has proposed cutting seven social workers. It would be possible to make up for much of the shortfall just by cutting salaries and raises at the top of the scale. For example, Excluding benefits, vacation days, raises, consulting fees, and other perks, our director and his five chiefs alone, are, alone earn salaries totaling around $1.2 million. This would pay for 22 social workers. Of course, we must pay our re leaders reasonable salaries, but in a budget crunch, it's critical that we keep our priorities straight. All of this is disappointing and distressing to me because I have placed my full support behind this administration. I believe the board and administration have done excellent high-level work during the last two years, and it's difficult to reconcile the work we've done with the issues I've raised. But it turns out that where the rubber meets the road, the focus is not really on students. This board must engage in difficult conversations about the district spending, and we have an obligation to make policy corrections wherever necessary. 
I propose that we immediately reduce the amount on contracts that the board approves, that we prohibit any further consulting fees by district employees at least until the audit is complete, and that we discuss installing an internal auditor to oversee MNPS spending who reports directly to the board. This board has a fiscal obligation to do the right thing, and I hope that we will take swift corrective action. Uh, Madam Chair, I know our time is up, uh, but uh, and, and I won't go into uh, too much detail, but I think it's important to just take a little extra time uh, to address some things. First, let me just say uh, there were a number of uh, not factual and accurate and accusatory uh, statements made, and we will clarify at another time, then I'll, I'll make it a point to do it. Uh, but I do want to address um, this, an example, and I'll, uh, just one example of some of the uh, inaccuracies. And I'll ask uh, Mr. North if he can come up here to just talk about the unauthorized purchases for an example, uh, because I just want to give that, because that's been in the media recently, and I think it was ill portrayed, I think it's important for us to just communicate and clarify what that $3 million was to help understand. Uh, we will, again, for time's sake, I will hold off and continue on this, but I'm very disappointed uh, that uh, we have two board members uh, that chose to uh, not communicate with the administration, but instead choose, chooses to uh, go out and make uh, ac accusations that are not only inaccurate, uh, but in my opinion, uh, disgrace the great work uh, that we've been doing. Uh, when we have staff members that have been working extremely hard, and one thing I am proud of uh, is the integrity uh, that I hold as we work to address the achievement of these 86,000 children within this <coughs> district, two children, including my own, here. Uh, I don't, I usually sit back and, and can listen, uh, but when I hear things that are accusations that are grossly false and uh, quite frankly offensive, uh, they must be addressed. Uh, but we'll go ahead and just talk about the, if with your permission, just at least clarify on the unauthorized purchases, because that is a term that we created. Uh, so we'll just, uh, Mr. North, if you can just go through what that actually is, and in general, uh, give what the $3 million difference was in general. And what we promised to do is by tomorrow, put out to the public the specifics of what those dollars were uh, so the public can have a general understanding. Uh, big concern, and I think I've cautioned this board before, uh, of making accusations that could be considered uh, libel, uh, because when we start calling people out and questioning their credentials and things of that nature, you put this board in a predicament where they will be sued for your inappropriate outburst and inappropriate comments, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll follow up with that. But Mr. North, if you can please uh, just address that, and then we'll end and get to the second part of the uh, hearings. The, the UPR process is really a, an additional safeguard and, and <coughs> for when the purchase order isn't on time. Sometimes the, the invoice comes before purchase order is completed for several reasons. Um, with regard to the amount, right, which is really, really the concern, uh, for the most part, they fall into two areas, uh, the large amounts. One is transportation. Uh, and there was a uh, it, substitute bus drivers. Um, the, the contract for those uh, ended up being paid um, for last school year uh, at the end of the school year with several um, UPRs, uh, and that totals $2 million. Uh, that is... But just to clarify, that's $2 million up to $3 million in question? That's, I, I believe that's correct. Um, an, another large amount is uh, some professional development, uh, quite a bit of which was to Lipscomb University, um, and we'll get those. And about how much was that? Uh, a little bit over half a million? Yeah, that's about 600000 uh, and so those those are the largest. And then uh, there was something for reading recovery, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that, that that's part of the the Lipscomb, uh, the the payment to Lipscomb. It's a reading recovery partnership, I think, is how it's labeled. Sure. Um, so those those are the those are the the 
amounts really and, and how does a how does an how does a purchase become unauthorized when we talk about an unauthorized purchase is it an illegal purchase is it a, per, 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 a purchase that was inappropriate uh, it, what, what does that mean just for the just for the public yeah it it didn't go through that purchase order process it doesn't mean that it wasn't uh, and, and in fact the UPR is is the additional process the later process to make sure that it's approved uh, both th by the, the department head um, and, um, and by the purchasing department. I, did, I just want to respond. So first of all, I did my homework on unauthorized purchase agreements, I mean pur purchase requests, and so I do know what those are, <laughs> as I, you might guess. I, don't doubt um, that. I took some of the language directly from MMPS communications, so I'm not making this up. This is, it's very serious when we are not following proper procurement procedures. And when you are not following proper procurement procedures, that generates UPRs, which means that you are not using a purchase order properly as you should. And I think that is something, that's why I'm asking, is that we, it warrants investigation. Um, I also want to say that I did communicate with the administration extensively. I've asked lots of questions. I've followed up many times. I've been doing this for about five to six weeks, so this is not out of the blue. And I also want to say that this is my job to ask questions of the director, and I am doing my job on behalf of the taxpayers, and I'm not quite sure who the director is suggesting might sue me. I don't know if the administration is intending to sue me for asking questions, oh, that but that's a real problem when there is a suggestion that there may be a lawsuit when I'm actually doing my job. And that's all I want now, to say. It's a lawsuit when you are inappropriately uh, pointing people out and, and making comments that are not I am doing my job, and I am not inappropriate. I am with um, Excuse me. I have I, the floor, excuse Ms. Burrow. Me, excuse me. I am doing my job. So I'm allowed to ask questions. I am allowed to specifically ask about particular line items and people. That's all I would like to say. So Dr. Gentry. thank you, Ms. Hunter. Uh, as a board, I think um, the appropriate, I'm, I'm sure what our intention is, is to figure out how we can help to not have to rely on the UPR. Is there anything that we can do from a policy perspective, um, whether it's going back and um, uh, being okay with there being more than five things on the consent agenda, um, doing a, uh, making it easier for board members to get access to the contracts in a timely fashion so that we can review them. Because I know what our intention is, is to be helpful uh, on behalf of the students. You know, I had a totally unrelated but um, I spent a week in Salt Lake City, and one of the presentations I got to hear was from, I think his name is Richard or Robert Sheridan. He is the CEO of Menlo Innovations, and he wrote a book called Joy Incorporated. And uh, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. And people from all over the world go and visit his company um, to wonder what is it about this place that people are actually happy to come to work. And there's just two things I want to point out. The first thing I want to share, and it's, there's many aspects of this company that make it the joyful place to work. One thing is that every employee is invested in other employees' success. So my goals as a Menlo employee are based on Thais Hunter's success, because I'm always partnered with somebody. I'm always vested in someone else's success. So as an, another elected member of this board, I say that I am invested in the success of the district, which includes our chiefs, our teachers, our bus drivers, all of our staff, everyone who has a role to play in the education of our children. So I think we need to recall that we are here to partner with administration to find the best way to do the best job that we can for our students. In mentioning students, the second thing I'll share is that among the many people that had come to visit Menlo Innovations was a uh, life and casualty company, an insurance company. And you know they just couldn't wrap their mind around this, this environment. And one of the questions that uh, the CEO asked of them was, who do you serve? 
you can't do your job, you can't do it well, you can't measure your success unless you are very clear about who it is you serve. And I know the tug of war between parents and voters and children. But I want to be very clear that we serve students first. And so he challenged them, and it, it blew their minds. Because their first answer was, we serve our policyholders. We, pay, we, we serve the stockholders. And he said, I would suggest that you think about the families that will call you when their loved ones have passed on, and the families that will call you when all of their possessions have burned to the ground. You don't serve policyholders. You serve actual real people. And so I'm looking forward to these additional discussions and meetings that have been requested so that we can do our role as board members and partners with this administration to make things better for our students and that we can continue to support the one employee we have, the one we actually hired to do this job and continue to do it well. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Thank you. Mrs. Spears. I'll just close out with saying that, or you can close, but yeah, I think uh, part of the support that we do have for Dr. Joseph does also require hard questions, Absolutely. and it and, um, and requires actually really knowing that some of the proposals that have been made have been well vetted, so that we can feel assured that when we vote on April 16th for the budget, that we are serving our students the best way possible, not just, you know, but I, I, so I've been struggling with getting too in the weeds of knowing so much on the ground of how people are feeling that some of the impacts are coming, um, but I'm, I'm continuing to press on and just trying to, to put in the buckets hype from reality to action and what can we really do right now. So um, anyway, this is ongoing, we're continuing. Um, but I do think this board is, we know that we need you to succeed for our students to succeed. Um, and when the African proverb, when the elephants fight, the grass is hurt the most, and those would be our children. I just have a few questions, Mr. North. How long did you serve on Metro School Board? Five and a half years. And how long, what years were they? 2007 to 2012. How were you tracking unauthorized purchase requests then? I don't remember. Did you track them? I, I don't remember. When did we begin tracking unauthorized purchase requests? I'm not, I'm not sure. Jeff Gossage is here. He can answer that question. I, I can speak to it as well. I've been in the, I'll also speak to it. Uh, I've been in the district for over 30 years, and we had UPRs. You said it was something you, you, we had, uh, we had um, <laughs> UPRs that like $15 when I was at the school level, uh, a purchase order that was not authorized. Uh, because of an emergency situation, because of something happened at the school, so uh, it, it is not a brand new thing that just happened over the last two years. Mr. Gossage, can you come to the microphone, please? Uh, Mr. Gossage is the head of purchasing for the district. Came in at a great time. Uh, <laughs> my predecessor, uh, Gary Appenfelter, began the program in 2015 that we're using today. It is an excellent tracking process to see what takes place and how it takes place procedurally, and also to record the, uh, the actual purchase so that we have a record of that. We can go back and see where we are and how much we have spent. So 2015 is when it began, 16 and probably ramped up some, and then this year. I would also say that even in hospitals, I looked it up online, and hospitals talk about how dangerous UPRs are. Colleges and universities talk about how dangerous UPRs are. Uh, so this is not just a school issue. You may have done some type of work since you've been here that made it different than it used to be, but it is, a, uh, it is an old process. It's not new. What is the percentage of UPRs based upon the entire budget that we have right now? Both in quantity and in dollars, it okay. is less than 1%. So we're, we have a 99% accuracy. That is awesome. 
and especially since we just started tracking it. So I would just like to say thank you to mainly our teachers and our staff, because they're the ones that are that are responsible primarily. And I don't know what was going on with the reading recovery um, people that were not. Can somebody speak to that? I'm just really curious. I can speak to it. Uh, when Gary Appenfelder was here and a uh, contract was about to uh, terminate, uh, Gary Appenfelder would let people know, and that didn't happen this time, and therefore uh, they, the contract with Lipscomb was uh, four years old. So it would have been easy to have uh, expanded or extended or renewed that contract, but the, um, the time frame uh, that people were used to Gary Appenfelder letting, giving them the heads up when a contract was coming due. So without that reading recovery contract concern, UPR, honestly, we, that means our percentage would have been even higher. So that's still a good thing to note. But um, I think that's all we have for today. Does anyone have any more questions? And I'll read, you read the meeting times next. Just to yes, I'll let you read them, Mary. Oops, Mary's going to read you the re meeting times. So we're going to follow this uh, meeting with a public hearing, and then we will have another board meeting tomorrow at 5 and the public hearing at 6. Do we not have the committee meeting at 4? Committee meeting tomorrow is canceled at 4 o'clock. Okay. It's Thursday. It's Thursday. Okay. And then we will meet Thursday. You shouldn't have had me read these because I don't know what they are. I've got them in my calendar at 4 o'clock. And then a public hearing at 5. Thank you all so very much for being in here and being invested in our children and the future of our children. Thank you, teachers especially. We know that your work is hard. We know that this year has been a huge learning curve, but we are very proud of the results that we produce. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That is, this meeting is adjourned. A five-minute break. A five-minute break. I got it. <laughs> yes. I got it. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.